test, test. All right, good afternoon, folks. Welcome to USAC Con 6.0. This is a uh, friend and fellow Longhorn with the horns. Or do you still, <laughs> never mind, I want to <laughs> Uh, it's Sokol. one o'clock and OU still sucks. That's right. <laughs> uh, Josh Sokol, I, well, he'll introduce himself, I yeah. can imagine. Uh, but this talk is titled uh, The Fox in the, hen, in the Hen House, The Technical Breach Before the Damage Is Done. Oop. All right, guys. So uh, the hardest time to talk at a security conference is after lunch because everybody is falling asleep and, and uh, whatnot. Um, we'll do our best to keep you guys awake. Um, yeah. I so. Well, Walter won't make any promises. All right. Um, so who am I? I'm Josh Sokol. Uh, I'm one of the global uh, board members for the OWASP Foundation. Uh, I'm one of the creators or the creator for Simple Risk, a uh, free open source risk management tool. Um, and I also run the security team over at National Instruments. Hi, I'm Walter Johnson. I have no accomplishments to my name, except for doing the last kind of graphics. Um, so I just put on a couple of basic facts about myself, like I currently reside in the third dimension with the rest of everyone else. <laughs> and I'm mostly composed of the same base elements as everyone else. And for those that uh, actually know Walter, it's actually the fourth dimension. He's a <laughs> little bit out there. Um, okay, so let, let's talk a little bit about the problem here. Um, if you if you are familiar with me, I did a talk a few years back um, called The Magic of Symbiotic Security. And in that talk, I talked a little bit about um, the challenges that we have with our different security tools and how all of our different security tools kind of sit in these silos and they don't talk to each other. And the cool thing is, um, over the past few years, I've actually seen a lot of these tools break out of the silos. And I've seen some vendors start to deliver some functionality to help break out of those silos. Um, but we still have a big problem here. And the, the big problem right now is holes. Right? Our firewalls are out there, but we intentionally poke holes in these firewalls. We intentionally poke holes so that our applications work, so that people can get to the things that make our companies money. So it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's a thing, right? We have web applications, and then we have users, these uh, creatures that sit on our network, and they do things that annoy us all as security people. They, they clicky clicky the emails that come in, even though they have no idea who that person was that sent it, or what that file attachment is, but it says like coolelves.exe, and they click it, right? Or they're browsing the web, and there's a, you know, you want a date with Britney Spears, click here, and of course they click there, right? So that is the problem today. Now, the other problem for us is one of visibility. Because while all these things are going on, uh, most organizations don't have visibility. Most organizations can't say, I see what's going on in my network. So if I ask you the question, Am, are you under attack right now? How many of you guys can answer that? Right? A few of you. The answer is yes, by the way. The answer is yes. Um, yeah. Uh, now, we can take that a step further and we can say, what systems are they attacking? What kind of attacks are they using? Who's attacking me? And were they successful, right? These are all questions that we ask ourselves on a daily basis. And unfortunately, a lot of us don't know the answer to that question, which leads me to the solution, right? The solution here is we have to create an ecosystem of tools. And these tools need to work together and they need to answer these questions for us. We need the tools that are able to talk to each other uh, to get that silo data out and to leverage it for mutual gain across those tools. And we need a platform that's going to enable the analysis of and reporting of threats in our environment in near real time. In short, we need security analytics. So that's what this talk is based on. Now these next couple slides you're going to see are kind of uh, pieces that I took out of that symbiotic security talk because I think it's important to, to kind of understand this. So you have to choose your tools wisely. Um, there are lots of different tools out there. You guys probably have all these different things in your environment. And choosing your tools is a matter of looking at what abilities those tools provide. And just because you're looking at the next generation firewall that has the most features doesn't necessarily mean that that's the best firewall for you. Because if what you're trying to do is break that firewall out of its silo, you're trying to provide that data to other tools in your environment, and that tool is not capable of doing that, you're actually doing yourself a disservice, even though that might be the best thing on the market today. So we want to look for tools that have this provider ability, tools that have open APIs, open databases, the ability to export data, um, SNMP dumps, and things like that. Those are the tools we want to look for. 
Likewise, when we're looking at tools in our environment, uh, we want to look for tools um, that's going to help to aggregate this data, to bring it all together in a single place. And so we're looking for tools that have this consumer capability, things that can consume events, alerts, SNMP, syslog, you know, all these different things that's the output of our tools. We want to be able to take those in and consolidate them into one place. But I have a caution for you. And that caution is some tools can be greedy, right? And what I mean by this is there are companies out there that, that create tools like Sim, for example, and they say, give me everything, give me everything, give me everything, right? And so that's what you do. You dump everything into it, and then they decide what you want to see. They decide what's best for you. They decide the answers for your environment. And sometimes that's good, especially if you're on a very, very small staff. But if you want to be able to do more, if you want to be able to um, enrich that data, if you want to be able to look at that data um, through a different lens, you're not able to do that. So we want tools that not only have this consuming ability, but also that providing ability, and are able to take that data and send it elsewhere so that you can use it in multiple locations. So what we want is symbiotic security. With symbiotic security, you can assemble a best of breed uh, arsenal of tools that all work together. And what this means is that even smaller purchases can have a huge impact in your environment. So it leads us to this question, right? The question is, or, or a set of questions. All of these questions that are up here have different data sources to answer them. And we all have tools in our environment that help to answer these things. So a good example is, what attacks are my systems vulnerable to? We all have vulnerability scanners. We have a pretty good idea of what our systems are vulnerable to. And that data is actually extremely useful if you're under attack. Because if there's a uh, SQL slammer worm that's trying to hit your network, I'm going old school here, people. Uh, if there's a SQL slammer worm that's trying to hit your network and you don't run a SQL database at all, you're not vulnerable to it, then that means nothing to you. Let it through. Who gives a crap, right? So we want to look at not only you know, one little strip of data, we want to look at data from all these silos. And we want to use all that data in order to make a, a informed decision on what we're going to do here. So that leads me to flow data. We discovered flow data three, four years ago. And it was like the angels were singing. Ah, it was amazing, right? Um, this is a common feature for all the modern routers and switches, which means you probably already have the ability to do flow data today. Um, it provides a whole lot of data for a reasonable amount of storage, and it can help you make a whole lot of security decisions easier. So what is flow data? Flow data is very, very simply, it is summary data of what's going on in your network today. It's going to be the source IP, the destination IP, ports, um, a little bit of information about the protocol and you know some information about the volume of data. That's about it. You don't get the data itself, so you can't tell, you know, if you see a, a packet fly across the network, you can tell where it's going, where it's coming from, but you don't know what the actual data was. But a lot of times, it doesn't matter. And so in, in a couple slides, Walter will tell you guys a little bit about some of the reports we're doing on NetFlow data, and you'll see very quickly how, how awesome that uh, information is. Um, so, a simple example here. Um, a few years back, HD Moore, you guys all know HD, right? Um, he wrote a white paper, and it was called Security Flaws in Universal Plug and Play. Um, and basically what he discovered just by scanning the internet like HD does, he has nothing better to do than to scan the internet, right? Um, he discovered that over 23 million IPs are vulnerable to remote code execution through a single UDP packet. Pretty big, right? Um, this affected something called SSDP, or Simple Service Discovery Protocol, which runs on port UDP 1900. Now, question for you guys. Uh, this, this is old, right? But how would you know today, you don't have to actually answer this, but how would you know today that this is happening? How would you know today that somebody is actively scanning your network to exploit that flaw? And I think the vast majority of us in this room would say, I have no idea. I don't have that ability, right? I might be able to tweak an IPS or write an IPS rule or whatever. But what we ended up doing is we wrote a rule. Um, this is, uh, we use a tool called Linksian. Um, I wouldn't necessarily recommend it. They, uh, the tool got sold off to Northrop Grumman. And hopefully, they'll make it better. Um, but the idea here is very simple. What we're trying to do is we're trying to create a rule that we can look for. Um, so what you see here is called pattern query language. 
And basically with PQ, PQL, what we're trying to do is we're trying to define what a packet looks like, what a session looks like. So I'm going to put my little pointer down here, and I'm going to explain this. So this is just a name, uh, external to internal UPMP. This is defining a source address, and we're saying it's not internal, so external source. This is saying we have an, a destination address that is inside, so we're defining this connection as coming from outside, moving inside. And then this is saying the protocol is 17, which is UDP, and destination port is 1900. So we've basically taken that white paper that HD released, all you know, 20 pages of it, and we've condensed it into this is exactly what we want to look for. Pretty easy. All this just defines is this connects to this, this connects to this, so we've said it's an actual connection. Um, and then we want to look at the source and the destination that matches that. Very, very simple. Now the cool thing is, when we run a search on this, it looks like this. Um, it, uh, this was 24 hours worth of data, um, and this returned 539 results in a minute and 38 seconds. So if I'm asking myself, is anybody looking for this on my network, the answer is yes. Right? Very, very simple. So. This is kind of uh, what Linksian does. Uh, it does this uh, graphing um, thing. And each of these, you can basically see kind of a, a hub and spoke, right? Where there's like a hub, and then uh, there's all these other things. These are all systems that are connecting in this one thing. So this is likely an IP address on my network, and these are all the other outside IPs that are trying to connect to me, right? Very simple. So let me zoom in on one of those. And you can see here, uh, I, I removed a few of these just for simplicity. This is exactly what we defined. We have a destination. This is on my network. We have a source. This is outside my network. Here's the network connection. And these are the guys who are trying to scan my network, right? These are the people who are trying to exploit this flaw in my network. So if that's the question that we're trying to answer, it is very, very simple for us to get at that data. And it doesn't have to be our tool. It can be um, you know, Splunk, it can be Elk, it can be whatever. The idea is we're looking for a very specific pattern in order to find what's going on here. Um, did you want to talk about this? Or was there more? I think so. I think this is the update one. OK. All right, so here's another example. In this case, what we're doing is we're saying uh, a source address that is internal. So this is coming from my network. Destination address is not internal. And the IP address is in this result list. So um, are you guys familiar with the malware domain list? Yeah? So um, malwaredomainlist.com, I want to say. You can go there. You can download this list. They updated, I think, multiple times a day. Um, and it's got a list of all the IP addresses, all the domains that are associated with malware. Um, and so what we did is we said, okay, you know, it'd be kind of cool if we took a look and we saw all the systems on our network that are talking to the malware domain list, any IP in the malware domain list. So that's what this is doing. Show me any source on our network that's talking to the malware domain list or an IP in that. And so it goes through, it searches through that, and then show me what the source is and how many times it's connecting. I don't really care about the destination, right? I don't need that. But what we're basically doing here is kind of a, a poor man's fire eye, right? We're, we're looking at all the, the systems on our network that are connecting there. So I've got 100 branch offices around the world that I'm responsible for. I can't afford a fire eye in every single one of those. Do this. So the results look something like this. Um, most of them return pattern matches that showed one malware domain list IP, and we have multiple internal hosts connecting to it. I'm not that worried about that. Um, to, to me, that, that wasn't as big a, of a deal. But then I saw this. And uh, for you guys in the back, you probably can't see this as well. But this is our internal host right here. And then these guys with the explanation marks are all guys who are tagged as malware domain list. So we have that one host that's talking to, what is that, probably 15, 20 different IPs, um, all on the malware domain list. That's the guy I care about. That's the bad guy, right? And then we have the symbiotic example. Um, the symbiotic example, what we did here is we said, OK, I want a source that is internal, a destination that, that's external, so I'm looking at outbound connection, and the instance is malware event. Malware event is actually we are sucking in data from our FireEye system that's coming into the same tool, 
And then what we're doing is we're uh, connecting the source and the destination, and we're connecting this new piece now that says malware target, so where this malware is targeted at connects to the destination. So we're looking at all the systems that are basically being exploited. Um, this is coming from our FireEye system, and then we're exploring the source of the destination and what kind of malware it is. So now we're actually able to use the multiple tools in our environment, our IPS system, our firewall, our uh, FireEye, our whatever, right? We can bring that in and we can run these queries on that data and come up with, here's the list, here's the list of the problem, right? So these are all the systems on our network. These are the IPs that they're talking to. You can see these little bombs here. That means that they're, um, they were detected by FireEye as the problem uh, or as bad guys. And if I zoom in on that, it looks something like that. All right? So all of them are talking to that guy. Now, we still have to do some level of investigation. We have to figure out if that IP actually is bad. You know, are they hosting malware? Is this some weird protocol that, um, you know, uh, the FireEye tag that it shouldn't have, right? So there's a little bit of uh, investigation there. But it's very easy for us to drill in and ask these questions um, and, and get answers to them very quickly. So I think here's where I'm going to hand it off to Walter. Um, and he's going to talk to you guys a little bit about some of the other useful security analytics that we run at NI. <clears throat> Hello. Hello, everyone. This is literally my first time standing up and talking in front of a crowd of people, so I'm a little flat. Actually, the second time, if you count when I introduced myself earlier. <laughs> Just standing back here, I am doing very good standing back here. That's great. It's all downhill from here. <laughs> All right, so we just um, we took a couple of shots of some of uh, the analytics that we have written within our Linksian tool. Um, this one was a really neat idea that Josh cooked up, and basically what it is is we have a whole subset of IP addresses on our network that have no computers attached to them. They're basically just kind of set aside. They're basically just kind of set aside to be used in the future, and since uh, there's no computers using them, there should definitely be no traffic going to those. IP addresses. And if there is traffic going to those IP addresses, then it's typically not something that should be there, right? So what we did, we wrote a little analytic. We wrote, um, we created, whoa, we created a result set called Darknet. That is a list of our IP addresses that are not to be used. Uh, and we basically just set it up so that the source address, if it's anything internal, and the destination address is anything internal, and ends up on that Darknet IP address range. Uh, then just give us a list of uh, you know the top ten systems that have connected to these dark range this dark net uh, range and um, you know how many times they've connected and what happens is bubbling up to the top we see the the systems that are connecting to these IP addresses the most in a lot of cases these systems have been compromised and they're just kind of scanning the network looking for other systems to to own or you know just doing some sort of information gathering. Um, and so that's what this analytic does, and it does a really, really good job of, of uh, kind of fishing those things out. Um, so in a lot of cases, when a machine is infected with a piece of malware, there may be data exfiltration, uh, and a, in a lot of cases, they can do that uh, through DNS. There's a, there's a whole little tricky tool set out there allowing you to make command and control calls through DNS or you know exfiltrate data through DNS. Um, but in a lot of times, Whenever they do that, then they're going to be pointing towards a specific DNS server, usually, uh, you know, CNC controlled uh, DNS server or something along those lines. So what we do here is we look for any machine that's connecting to more than one DNS server. Most of our machines are going to be connecting to our internal DNS server. Uh, we don't really enforce that, so some people might be going out and using Google's DNS servers, but it should be fairly rare that someone is using more than one DNS server at a time. Uh, and so what we do is we look for traffic um, anywhere that's internal. Our source address is internal. Our destination address is, of course, external. Uh, we're looking for destination ports 53 and protocol 17. So we're looking at all of our DNS requests. Uh, and then, you know, just give us the ones that are connecting to more than, more than one site. And that, so we can kind of investigate those machines to see if they're uh, infected with any sort of malware or anything like that. Um, and then, you know, talking, speaking of data exfiltration, uh, we have this one here that is a very, uh, I think you wrote this one, right? This is a very good one. Uh, and basically what it does is it looks for anyone who within 24 hours time period is sending out more than, what do you have it set to? 
Oh, top 25 data. So what we do is we, we kind of just, uh, we get the top 25 most amount of data going out to one IP address. Uh, and then at the top, you know, we just look at, okay, well, how come you've sent 25 gigs worth of data out to this IP address in China? Uh, you have absolutely no reason to do that. And so we start investigating the machine to see if there's any sort of, uh, any sort of compromise or anything like that that would uh, lead to data exfiltration like that. And again, it's uh, uh, source address is internal, destination address is external, uh, and then we just kind of do a, a sum of the connection bytes in order to, to go on with that. Uh, what is this one? Network reconnaissance. Is this one doing port scans? Yeah, it's our simple fan. So basically what we're doing is we're looking at a machine that is connecting to uh, a machine. Uh, okay, so we're looking for a machine that is internal, that is connecting to another machine that is internal on multiple ports. Um, and so what we do is we just kind of set a threshold for that. We're like, okay, if you connect to a system on you know, 15 ports, we don't really care. If you connect to every single port on a system, then okay, we've got a problem. We're gonna come, we're gonna come knock on your door and take a look at your system. Uh, and in a couple of cases, there may be someone who just has a headless Raspberry Pi somewhere and they are looking for it. They, they forgot their own IP address and they're just scanning the network looking for their own device. But in, but in some cases, it's an actual compromise. Yeah, very true story. Actual compromise machine. I still have more slides? All right. <laughs> oh, outbound connections by protocol. I didn't even read over this one. Oh, okay, this is another port scan to external devices. Yeah, so it's a lot like the previous one, except for what we're doing now is we're looking for uh, people who are internal. We're looking at specific source IP. Yeah, oh, that's right. You can input. So right here you can do target string, so whenever you run the actual analytic, it'll pop up and say, hey, give me the IP address. We can just type in the IP address and kind of run a, a baseline analytic on that. See, what has this machine been connecting to? Internal, external, all that kind of stuff. Uh, just kind of just get a little, um, let's say the machine's been compromised. We know it's been compromised. We want to see what else it's been talking to on our network. Then we'll run this analytic and we can see, oh, okay, well, uh, it sent a whole bunch of communications to your, your email server. You might want to look into that. Or, you know, it sent a whole bunch of connections to your uh, web server. Once it was compromised, you might want to look into that sort of thing. And I think it's you. Yeah? I'm going to repeat real quick for the recording. Um, so the question was on the data exfiltration, the top 25 report, um, what do we do when we find something that, that's actually a false positive? Um, and do you want to answer or do you want me to? Um, so we actually have the ability to, um, just like you see in here, where we can say where is internal is false or whatever, you can do and IPv4 address not equal to this and not equal to this. So it's a, a very like Boolean language. Uh, you can use kind of uh, regular expressions if you want to. And so um, we've actually had this problem like uh, crash plan, for example, is a good example where we have internal hosts that back up data. It's you know multiple gigs. It easily shows up on this report. Um, so we just say, hey, if it's going to crash plan, it's a known uh, program. There's no reason to uh, detect that. No reason for us to react to that. Let's whitelist it and, and gone. Yeah. Well, what happens if that system does actually get compromised at a later point in time? You're not. You're not blacklisting the system. You're blacklisting the IP that's yeah, going to. Um, so we're, we're still, we very much want to know what else that system is talking to. We just don't care that it's talking a crash plan. That's not going to show up in our report. Cool. All right. Okay. So, uh, performing instant detection response with flow data. So, uh, if you guys saw this, right, this is that connections to darknet report that we wrote that looks for systems talking to IP addresses on our network that are, are there's nothing there, right? Um, so if you guys saw this, one system, 641 counts, um, th that would probably be a red flag, right? But it would be something that would have you like running down the hair, down the hallway with, you know, pulling your hair out and screaming the sky is falling, probably not. But then you start looking at this and you're like, well, that same IP also showed up in that fan analytic. That means that it's basically doing scanning our network, right? Um, and so here's the sensor that caught that and there were 2,866 uh, times that it did that. 
Well, that starts getting a little bit more suspicious, right? And then we get to this point where uh, this was a custom analytic that we had written um, based on zero access. And what I had found is that zero access seemed to be connecting to some very specific ports, um, trying to look for, I don't know, command and control or uh, signs of compromise or whatever. But it was these specific UDP ports. And that guy showed up on there too, 68 times. Now you start thinking, what is going on, right? This is a system where, like, there's something weird for sure going on. Um, so quick poll. Uh, today, right now, you guys know what we're doing here. Assuming that you could detect this, could you answer these four questions? What is connecting the IP address? What is the IP address connecting to? Do I have any alerts associated with the IP address? And is there any significant amount of data loss from that system? Show of hands, can you answer this question? We have three people, and we got probably 50 plus in this room, right? That is not good. That is very low odds. So hopefully after this uh, presentation, you guys all go back. You start thinking about things a little bit differently. Um, one of the things that we've kind of come to realize, and it said this in the abstract, is it is no longer sufficient to have these kind of border products, right? Um, people will find their way in, as we introduce. You've got the firewall, you've got web applications, you've got users. It's a sieve. People will get in. And so these are the kind of questions as security professionals we need to be asking and answering in order to actually be effective at keeping the bad guys off of our network. So for the first question, what is connecting the IP address? We write a little pattern for that. Um, this target string, that's going to prompt us for the IP. We pop the IP address in there. Um, it's going to say where the destination is that target, uh, give me the count for that source. Um, we can do some filtering on date range. If it's a specific range, we can say, you know, relative to the last week or whatever. Um, we pop that IP address into there. Uh, we run it, and oh my gosh, there's 500,856 results, right? And I can do some analysis on that. I can sort by count. Um, and I found a couple in there that were kind of odd, like Dewan communications, that seemed weird. Dude likes Facebook a lot, you know, good or bad, whatever, right? So question two, what is the IP address connecting to? Well, we write another pattern query. This time I basically flip the IP address to be the source, not the destination. Um, so we're looking at what that guy is trying to connect to, run the query, and I've got 846,000 results. Okay, we do a little sorting, you know, a little manipulation. It's talking to AWS, feral hosting, soft layer. That Dewan guy popped up again. I don't know what that is. Um, Hosted-by.ihc.ru. Always suspect the Russians, right? <laughs> yeah. It's, that's racist, guys. Stop it. <laughs> um, no. Nah, so, but, but yeah, I mean, there, there's some odd stuff in there, right? Um, okay, so we got that question answered. Do I have any alerts associated with the IP address? Okay. So we, uh, we do that, um, the thing that combines our FireEye, our um, IPS system, we run a, those uh, couple queries, and we got no, no results. Okay, so our, what that means is that our incident detection system and our FireEye system did not find this host game compromise, right? We're talking about the effectiveness of our tools here. Not very good. And then question four, is there any significant amount of data loss from that system? So we do the same thing. We're going to look at the IPv4 address target on the source address, and now we're going to look at the sum of those connections, and we get a list that looks something like this. And we sort it by um, the number of megabytes, and we can see uh, LV, I think that's Latvia perhaps, um, 18 megs going to there, 13.54 megs going to India. Um, there's a few other uh, interesting, there's another Latvia on there, um, Romania, right, Russia. Um, now we can't necessarily say that this is bad traffic, right? Um, but we can definitely say that there's a suspect, and we can answer those questions, and we can then go and we can say, okay, our incident response, our service desk, or whatever, let's run a scan on this machine. Let's see, you know, let's do an additional level of diligence to make sure that this guy is truly clean. All right. So Walter's going to talk to you guys about honeypots and elk. He's doing pretty good for his first time, isn't he? Yeah. All right. Thank you. I only made the microphone yell a couple times. Today. Don't point it at the speaker. <laughs> All right. Um, so I've started a couple of projects recently, um, and they're kind of like my favorite things to talk about, so that's why I'm up here talking about them. Um, 
So I've always been pretty interested in honeypots. Uh, I used to try to play around with a software called Nova, which emulates uh, a whole ton of honeypots on your network, but they all kind of stay in the same location. And I wanted to take that a little bit further. Um, so what I did was I talked the company into buying me a handful of Raspberry Pis. Uh, very cheap devices. It says 70 here, but they're like 60, 65. Well, I guess if you want to buy the SD cards, which you right. kind of have to. Yeah, that's fair enough. Um, and then what I did was, uh, there's this, there's a software out there called Modern Honey Network made by Threatstream. They just released it uh, sometime last year. And what it is, is it's a server that runs uh, and it helps you deploy and manage your honeypots. So it's, a, it's basically a web interface. You choose what kind of honeypot you want. You go over to your, your system you want to run a honeypot on. You run one shell script command and it connects back to the Modern Honey Network and it downloads all the information it needs and it sets up uh, your, your honeypots and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I didn't want to go to machines and, or like remote into a machine in, in one of our branch locations and say, hey, I, you know, run the shell script on this machine. So what I ended up doing was I got all these honeypots um, and I set them up so that they would be... Okay, yeah, I'm only running Dionia right now. And in fact, I don't even know if that's how you pronounce it. It's the uh, Venus flytrap. If anyone knows how to pronounce that, that would be great. Nope, all right. Um, What's that? Yeah, I know, right? Who, who knows anything about plants here? Um, so what Dionia is, is it is a malware capturing honeypot. And the idea is that um, it listens on a few ports. It reports connections to any port on it, but it listens on a few ports and it waits for malware. So worms like, um, what's, the, what's the one that, Configure, you guys do NetBIOS? Yeah, so worms like Configure, um, what it does is it'll exploit a NetBIOS protocol and, and drop a piece of malware using this exploit. Um, and so what Dionia does is it pretends to be exploited. It acts like it's an SMB server, and whenever something throws an exploit at it, it goes, oh, I'm exploited, throw your malware at me, and the malware drops on, and it analyzes it. Um, Kippo is a an, is an high interaction SSH honeypot, and so what that means is, um, as an attacker, I would connect to it, it would look like I'm SSHing into any box, uh, I could try some default passwords and it will let me in. And then once I'm in, I can set up persistence, backdoors, whatever I want. And uh, what the honeypot does is it just records all of that data. It's not actually compromised. It just records all that data. And whenever the hacker leaves, then it just kind of resets back to the way it was. Um, so that way you can kind of capture what, what the hacker's doing whenever they attack your machine. Exactly what they do when they think they've compromised a box. So There's, there's a lot of different types of honeypots out there. This, these are just two of the types whole lot of different ones that MSN has. Right. There's high interaction ones, which are like Kippo. It, it responds back to the hacker. There's low interaction ones that do nothing, like the, the attacker may throw some commands at it, and it'll just do nothing. And then additionally, um, so one of the problems that I had with the honeypots was that whenever it connected to Modern Honey Network to set it up initially, whatever IP address Modern Honey Network gave it, uh, it stuck with that IP address. And so if I took the honeypot off of the network, moved it to another location, it got a different IP address, it would quit communicating with the, with the Modern Honey Network software. So I had to come up with a workaround for that, and the, I, my workaround for that was to install VPN software on my MHN server, have my honeypots VPN into my MHN server, get a, like a VPN IP address, all the communication is done over that VPN, and if I take that honeypot and I put it somewhere else on our network, it's gonna VPN in, it's gonna get the same VPN IP address, and so all the communications will pick up exactly the way it was before. So this is kind of like an example of some of the attacks. Um, I have, like I said, I have probably about 40 of these honeypots out there. There's usually only about 25 online at any given time. They just go off and online. Um, and so what happens here is once they're attacked, let's say someone does a port scan on it, it will report on every port that that machine touched. So if it, you, know, you, you connect to port 1 through 200, it's going to give me 200 alerts. Um, but what will happen is the system is attacked, it shows up here, you can see, you can just go here, you can click on uh, the system, the honeypot that was attacked, and you can see a little bit more information about it. My naming, you talk about my naming convention? I random, I pick random names, literally I just kind of like, I, some of them, some of them were, yeah, I don't have any up here, oh, payroll dev, yeah. So I picked some names that I thought that a hacker might want to go after. Uh, I've got one named MasterCard, I've got one named Visa out there. There's payroll dev, I have um, accounting backup is another machine. It's basically something that if you were an attacker and you were on a network and you saw a machine named this, you might go, there's something on there that I want, or there's something there that uh, uh, might not be well protected. I have one called Windows XP because... <laughs> 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 and by the time you get on that system, you realize it's not 
Windows XP is too late. Yeah, it's, it's too late. We, all you got to do is scan the machine. All you got to do is make a single connection to the machine, and I've got an alert saying that you've, that you've connected this machine. Um, and so what I've been doing with these guys is we just distributed them all to all of our branch locations. Everywhere that we're not fully protected, everywhere that we are fully protected, it doesn't matter. We just put these, I send them out to locations, I say, hey, someone take this, plug it into the network, plug it into some power, forget about it. Don't ever touch it again unless I tell you to. Um, and so all over the world I have these little honeypot sensors that are all internal and they're all com communicating back to my, um, my MHN server and every time they get attacked I get an alert. It's very cool. So here's an example of one of the payloads that I got. I told you that Dione was a, a malware capturing um, honeypot and so it did exactly what it was supposed to do and what happened was we had a machine on our network that was infected with Configur for some reason <laughs> even though Configur is like what 15 years old or something ridiculous like that. Um, and so it hit one of my honeypots. My honeypot responded back saying, yes, I am open on port, you know, 445. Please continue. Uh, and they, they sent the payload to it. Uh, the payload dropped the malware. And what I ended up getting was a hash of the piece of malware that it dropped, which I then took over to VirusTotal. And I put the hash into VirusTotal. And it goes, hey, <laughs> that's nothing good. It is a configure worm. And still, surprisingly, not everyone picked it up. You would think that everyone would pick up something that old. Uh -oh. So real, real quick backstory on this guy, um, our desktop security guy, um, he referred to these systems in China as leaky pipes because Comficker was out there, he knew it was out there, and he could never track down patient zero. It was as soon as we got one of these honeypots on the network that we found patient zero and we haven't had that, that issue ever since. Yep. No Comficker since. Um, so that's the honeypot stuff. Uh, if you guys have any questions about it, just come talk to me. I could talk for hours about it because I've worked on it for weeks and, and hours and miles. It's just, I, I just keep going on and on with it. Um, but my other project is, is setting up Elk. Does anybody know what Elk is? What an Elk stack is? Um, okay, is anybody here use Splunk? All right, is anyone here tired of paying a lot of money to Splunk? So Elk is an open source version of Splunk. It's, it's an open source kind of like a replacement for Splunk. Um, you can you can pay them, you can get a professional license or whatever, and they don't charge you by the gigabyte or by the, okay. They don't charge you by the gigabyte like Splunk does, and it's very cool, it's very easy to set up, and so that's what I've been doing. Um, so I've got my, I've got Elk set up, and what it is is it's a stack. It's a lot like a LAMP stack where you got your Linux and your Apache and your My, MySQL, uh, except this stack of products. The first one is Elasticsearch, which is basically, um, it's, uh, yeah, Hadoop. You guys, that's the word I was looking for. You guys know Hadoop? It's basically Hadoop. Logstash is what we use to transport the logs. You install it on your server. You say, hey, look at these log files, or look at this SQL database, or look at whatever you want to log. And at any time that that file or that database is updated, it takes that information, it sends it back, and plugs it into Elasticsearch. And Kibana is the web front end for it that allows you to do a whole bunch of uh, visualizations, which I'll show you in a second, and uh, graphing, and basically just be able to search through all of your data. It's basically your, your Splunk front end where you go search for data within Splunk. Um, it's very cool. I would highly recommend it to anyone who wants to do it for anything. So the idea here is since I'm just kind of setting it up on my own, and what I'm doing is I'm pointing a lot of our security products to it. Uh, FireEye dumps data in there. Our IPS dumps data in there. Uh, the information from my honeypots gets dumped in there so I can kind of correlate amongst all of my attacks, you know, what is important. But also the visualization of data because management likes that. Um, so here is one that I wrote. Oh, you can't read any of that. Awesome. Um, so what this does is this looks at all of our McAfee alerts. And I have uh, here, you know, our, our this axis is how many alerts we've got. This axis over here is the name of the alert itself, and then these are our IP addresses that are doing the, the naughty things. Um, so I had a huge spike in like peer-to-peer -peer traffic right here, and that's what's going on. Uh, and you can see that I have this huge spike of peer-to-peer -peer traffic, and these two guys are the main cause of that. And so, yeah. <laughs> and so with, the, uh, with the visualization like this, you can actually set it up in a dashboard and set it up real time so that it refreshes every minute or every five minutes or whatever. And if you just keep that on up above your desk, all of a sudden you can see well, there's something, there's something weird going on over here. Let's take a look into that. Um, and that happened once more here. What I have here is just the timeline. You can see it's 10 o'clock to 13.30. And it's a list of all of our alerts from all of our appliances so far. And you can see, look at this crazy thing. We had a sudden huge spike in traffic from a Vetra appliance that we we're doing a POC on. Um, 
And for the most part, we probably would have just missed it. But I keep this on. up above, I have a monitor up above my desk that I keep online. And I just kind of glance up at it every now and then. And I see this go by. I'm like, there's something going on. <laughs> there's something going on. So uh, we started looking into it. And, and actually, it was a problem with Vectra. And it wasn't even a problem with our uh, uh, a system on our network or anything. But with visualization like this, I was able to spot that sort of thing very, very quickly. Um, and so this is all the Kibana part. Kibana does all of these visualizations and allows you to set all this stuff up. I think you can do something similar with Splunk. What's interesting is I had never even messed with Splunk before I started this. So this was my intro into any sort of sim or logging or anything like that. Um, for the log stash portion of it, I just I wanted to show you guys what a, what a little simple custom integration looks like. Um, so basically what I have here with log stash is an input. It's listening on port. 5514, and anything that comes in on port 5514 is automatically tagged as a FireEye alert. Uh, once the alert comes in, it runs through this filter. Uh, everything is in JSON, so the idea is you just want to get all of, all of your information to basically JSON format using this awesome Grok utility. Um, I don't know if Grok is even used anywhere else, but it is used heavily in Logstash, and it's like the most amazing like text parsing tool I've ever used in my life. It's great. Uh, and then, of course, the output down here says send it to the local host, so just loop it back, and to my log stash cluster. So everything just goes, uh, goes into my Elasticsearch server, which is on the local host, and the name of it is log stash. So um, with this kind of sim, we're able to throw all of our data into this big pile and kind of correlate across it. If there's an alert coming in on FireEye, I can just click on it and say, okay, well, show me where this IP address is showing up on any of our other alerts. Is it showing up in MACV? Is it showing up in our Linksy and stuff? And so on and so forth. And that's that. There you go. I don't see any eyelids, so I think we're doing all right at keeping you guys awake. This guy was falling asleep. All right, but the good news is uh, I do see people writing down little notes and whatnot. Um, we can make this presentation available too if you guys want to check it out afterwards. Um, but, but have no issues with that. Um, I wanted to expand a little bit and talk about uh, how to get other things reporting into it. Um, there's something called the Collective Intelligence Framework. Um, this is something you can grab off of Google Code. Um, the idea behind SIF is that you can basically pull feeds from all sorts of different sources and bring it into one environment. Um, we haven't played around with this at this point, um, but it was something that I had found a while back and it uh, kind of earmarked it for later uh, because it's a really cool idea. How do we grab you know, all these different sources that are out there? Every vendor out there is offering their own intelligence feed. How do we aggregate that in one place and use that to enrich the data in our environment? Um, and then uh, next steps, right? You know, we have the data. How do we respond to these incidents? How do we handle that stuff? Um, so. You know, the cool thing is uh, we can answer these questions like, are there other alerts associated with uh, this host on my IPS or other monitoring devices? We know the answer is no, um, but what about uh, reputation data? Well, there's sites like WAFSEC or MACV Threat Intelligence where you can feed in an IP address and it comes back and it says the reputation of this site is X, right? And in this case, uh, of the example I showed you guys before, that kind of looks like a false positive. You know, there's, there's no big... Uh, no big deal there is Amazon Inc. was the IP address that came up. So we're not going to worry too much about that one. Um, what else can we do, though? Um, we can uh, leverage these analytics for real-time decision making. And this is uh, the world of NAC is actually starting to get in on this. But you can very easily script this stuff. Um, Splunk has the ability to run scripts. You can do the same kind of thing out of the ELK stack. Um, and you can actually say, if the behavior is this, then do this, right? So if the question is, should I accept some packets from some random IP, well, why not throw that data through a reputation engine, an attack engine, a vulnerability engine, um, analyze our trust boundaries, whatever information that we have out there that might be useful to answer this question, let's throw it through that. If it's a high value asset, you know, we can do some uh, basic filtering and say, is that somebody who I should allow, yes or no? Um, should I allow some random person to download a file? Well, we can do the same kind of thing. What's the data classification of the file? What's the reputation of, of that source? Um, is there any authentication or authorization that's involved with this, right? So we can, we, if we can break those tools out of the silos, get them talking to each other, you know, use some sort of analytics platform, whatever we need to, uh, in order to aggregate that data, we can start making some very complex decisions about what happens in our environment. The other thing that we can do is we can take action, right? We can block an IP address using a firewall or an IPS. 
We may be able to create WAF rules based on some sort of attack data. Um, we could ban a system from communicating our network based on the fact that that system is, is uh, communicating with the malware domain list. Um, we might be able to require additional authentication before they can do something. Um, I'd even pose that you may be able to attack back. I saw an interesting presentation a while back um, where I think it was uh, Ryan Barnett was talking about using mod security to actually inject a beef hook into the browser of the attacker and then you've basically attacked the attacker. It's pretty cool. Um, but there's an interesting quote from the dude who got uh, pawned over at HB Gary. He said, the bad guys are so pervasive, according to Hoglund, that some companies are taking matters into their own hands. Victims of attacks are fighting back by hacking the hackers, where the hacker becomes the hacky. Say that ten times fast, right? Um, that turned out real well for him, didn't it? Yeah, yeah oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how he's doing these days. <laughs> in, in any case, uh, summary here is, you know, a lot of our companies suffer from a lack of visibility into critical security threats. I think we're all well aware of that. Um, these security analytics allow us to see these uh, threats and react to them. Um, ideal tools are going to be ones that have this ability to both provide data to other things as well as consume it, um, combine these tools together, uh, gives us context that we can then use to make informed decisions and our network flow day is actually kind of the glue that ties the events together and helps to illustrate the attack progression. Um, real quick plug, next week in Austin is LastCon. Um, there's training sessions, there's conference which is super, super cheap. Um, and then if you guys are application security people and you want to learn about the OWASP Top 10, Dan Cornell and I are actually doing a free training on Wednesday next week in Austin at the Norris Conference Center. Um, so with that, uh, thank you, and we'll open the floor for questions. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the, the question was, has any thought been put into localizing some of these rules? Um, because, for example, an attack, uh, a, a destination of .ru in Russia, for example, probably wouldn't be something that we care about. Um, absolutely. In fact, like the Day Axfil reports, um, I've localized all of those for like our Bangalore branch and our Russia branch and whatever. Um, we've, we've done that. Um, for a couple reasons. One is reporting. You can actually send an alert to the branch manager on a daily basis. Here's the data that's going out in your environment. It's very valuable. Um, and two, for localization purposes, we can remove certain sets of IPs. In our case, we kind of want to know what all those are, but we can have a high level thing for the security team and then have lower level things for each of the individual branches. Other questions? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, and then also sort of a roadmap based on where you're at now, what's the best way to make the Because obviously a lot of folks can't pay attention to where they are now. Yeah. Where we're going, there are no roads. <laughs> Um, so in terms of maturity model, I would refer you back to the Magic of Symbiotic Security presentation that Dan Cornell and I did a, a few years back. Um, it very much talks about uh, that in way more detail. I didn't want to rehash old stuff. Um, in terms of kind of the, the roadmap, um, yeah, we, we can definitely put some of that forward. Yeah. Other questions? I saw. Uh, we will share our slides, absolutely. Um, I don't know if they have if they have something here, but We'll, we'll post it somewhere. Send me an email. Yeah. Uh, so the question is like, where are we getting logs from? Um, it doesn't really matter. You can take data from any source. That, that's where we were talking about the provider and consumer capability. It doesn't really matter what we're using at NI because every organization um, is a unique flower, right? Um, and, and so, yeah, I, it, it doesn't matter what we're using. The idea is that you should be able to use whatever tools make sense in your environment. Back? Yeah. You're going to have to speak up because it's loud out there. 
<laughs> okay, uh, I think we're, we're about done with the time, but feel free to come up afterwards and we'll talk to you guys.